Now the next parable we're going to read, it's a little different from the parable we just read. We're going to have to read, we're going to read verses 34 through 39 to understand the verses 24 on down. So before I start with verse 24, let's read verses 34 through 39 so we can get an understanding on 24 on down, okay? Verse 34 says, All these things spake Jesus unto the multitudes in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them. When Jesus spoke to, to the multitudes, he spoke in parables, which was to explain the beginning, which I explained at the beginning of the teaching last week. So we know about that already, why he spoke in parables. And in verse 35 that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. That's why we have parables, uh, like I said last week, so we can understand them. And I'll tell you why he didn't want the unbelievers to understand them. He would, this wasn't preaching salvation. He wants the lost people to understand salvation. But there were some things he didn't want them to know, and he, but he did want us to know. And that's why he spoke in parables. In verse 36, Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And this, his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And the disciples wanted Jesus to explain what he meant by the parable he had just spoken about, about the tares. To understand verses 34, uh, 24 through 30, you definitely need to understand the next three verses. This tells you everything. It tells you what sow seed. It tells you everything you need to know to understand verses 34 through 30. He says, He answers unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of God. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world. And the weepers are the angels. Okay, right here, he tells us everything we need to know to understand verses 24 through 30. So the sower is who? Is Jesus. The seed is the Christian. The field is the world. The enemy is the devil. The terrors are lost people. The wheat are the children of God. The harvest is the end of the world. And the weepers are the angels. So verses 37 through 39, it, it tells us. Verse 24, Another parable put he forth unto them, unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which soweth good seed in his field. Like we said, the man is Jesus, and his good seed is the Christian. And the field is the world. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. So while they slept, this is uh, representing darkness. While they slept. The enemy, like I said, is the devil. He came. Christians have to realize that we do have an enemy. Y'all do know that, right? What's the enemy want for you? He wants destruction for you. The enemy does not want anything good for you. All he wants for you is evil. And he uses anything or anybody to do this. The devil will use anything or anybody to get to you. He can use people, whether it be relatives, friends, people you don't even know. But he can use people to tempt you or to bring you down. Anything it could be like your job, like income tax, anything. Anything that can bring you down, that's what the devil wants to use. If he knows this can get to you, that's what he's going to use on you. Because once he brings you down, how can you have your eyes on the Lord? Because at the time, you're feeling a pity, por pity party. You're feeling sorry for yourself. Why this is happening or why that is happening. And if you're doing that, where's your eyes? It's not on the Lord. It's on yourself. Right? Is it wrong to be upset about something? No, there's, there's the Bible teaches just like when Jesus went into the temple and turned the tables over and everything. 
because they were using the table f- to make money. No, there's there's a righteous anger. Okay, there is a righteous anger, but make sure it's a righteous anger. Okay. Yeah. When it first hit you, and most of us, it does get us that way. But then, as soon as, and the Lord will, He will speak to you and say, "Hey, hey, I got it under control." And then that's when we need to stop and say, "Yes, Lord." Just for a minute there, I forgot. So there's nothing wrong with that. But when we get that way, we got to recognize: is it from the Lord or is it from the devil? Who wants us to be sad? Depressed, unhappy. The devil. The Lord doesn't want us to be that way. That's why I've given the teaching on God's rest. We can have happiness all the time through the trials and tribulation of the world. Remember that. We can have happiness. He said we can be full of joy. And these teachings that I give you, you got to remember those. If you got to go home and on, on your notes, people who take notes, go home and look at those notes again. Because I tell you this time, and maybe a month, maybe a year, maybe you done forgot about this. So it's always good to go over your notes and remember, trying to refresh yourself from what God has said to you. Because this is what these teachings are. These teachings are from the Lord. I'm just using His words to teach His words. So there's nothing wrong with repetition, reading something over again, or uh, these teachings. You know, like I said, if you got notes on other teachings go home and just look over them it's it's always good to refresh yourself what the lord has has has, uh given you so we have an enemy and this enemy wants to kill you he wants to destroy you we need to remember that we need to recognize that because that'll help us through a lot of stuff when we see this is not coming from god and we're gonna next week when i start on job we're going to see, we're going to learn a lot from Job, okay? We're going to learn how, um, and most of y'all know, the devil, he had to ask the Lord, he had to ask God, can I do this to him? He had to ask God. But we're going to learn all about that. Sometimes God allows the devil to do whatever it is to us. He allows, he's not doing it, but he's allowing well, I'm going to stop right there because then I'll start. I'm going to get on Job, and I'm not even knowing that tonight. But that's that's going to be a good teaching, so be here next week. Verse 26. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So what this is saying, when a Christian starts walking with the Lord, they bring forth fruit, like the Beatitudes. You don't recognize a lost person, recognize a lost person until... The Christian starts bringing forth fruit. The Christian and the lost person, until that Christian starts bringing forth fruit, he looks just like the lost person. They look the same. But right here it says it, that uh, the tares were coming up with the Christians. With the wheat, the tares was coming up. You have to be a religious or moral person. Religious people or and morally people can look like Christians. They sound like Christians, but the only thing between them and us, our heart, is with the Lord. Titus 3, 5, I've told you before, it's not how righteous or how good you think you are that makes you right with God. Because believe it or not, there's a lot of people out there who think if their good outweighs their bad, they're going to make it to heaven. There's a lot of people out there who believe that. If they're out good, outweighs their bad, they're going to heaven. But Titus says it doesn't matter how righteous you are. It doesn't matter how good you are. Unless you give your heart to the Lord, unless you get born again, where the Lord can wash you, cleanse you, you can't have His righteousness. Like I said before, you can't tell the difference between uh, uh, the two people until, until the fruits start producing. When the wheat starts to ripen and starts to bear grain, then you can start seeing the fruits. It's just like a baby Christian. When he starts walking, when he's reading the Word of God and he starts to grow, you're going to start seeing his fruits. God's fruits. That's the fruits you're going to see. Now the tares, the weeds, like I said before, I think last last week, their fruits are just the opposite from the fruits of the Lord. 
They bring, they bring corrupt fruit. Remember? So until they start to grow, you really don't, you, you can't tell the difference. Like I said, you take a baby Christian and you take a, a lost person, there's not really that much difference between them. But once that baby Christian starts to grow, then he starts getting the fruits of God in him. The way your fruits will show is by just keeping your eyes on the Lord. You keep your eyes on the Lord and you're going to be producing fruit. And like Brandon just say, and your light will shine. It's not that you have to concentrate bearing fruit or you have to concentrate, oh, I got to shine like a light, like, like a light. No, you don't think about it. Just walk with the Lord. The light will come and the fruits will come. You don't have to concentrate on them. If you're walking with the Lord, all this is automatic. This is a promise that's going to happen to you. This is, this is a promise from God. If you keep your eyes on me, you will produce these kind of fruits. And your light will shine. Uh, Philippians 1.11 It says, Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness. Our righteousness comes from where? From us or from the Lord? All righteousness comes from the Lord. Now you got people who got their own righteousness. Like I said, morally good people or religious people. They got their own righteousness. But the righteousness we have is by Jesus Christ. Galatians 1.6 It says, Which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit, as it doeth also in you since the day ye heard of it. And knew the grace of God and truth. When's it going to come on you? When you learn this. Ephesians 2.10 For we are, are his workmanship. I've been a Christian for how long? Uh, 30 years. He ain't finished with me yet. As, as long as I'm here on this earth. Living in this body. With this sinful nature. He's going to be working on me. Until the day I go to be with him. Then I'll be perfect. But as long as I'm in this body, I will never be perfect. The Lord will always have to be cleaning me. Mold me into that Christian. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of people don't allow Him to clean. They like that dirt they have. Whatever it may be. They might, you know, maybe a little lie, maybe a little cheat, you know, maybe a little adultery. Just, you know, they, they like to keep a little dirtiness on them. So they really don't want the Lord to, to, to cleanse them completely. And what's that mean? It means it hasn't, they haven't given them 100% of their heart. Because when they want to keep some of what they want, they didn't give the Lord 100%. All. So when we, when, we live, when we give our life to the Lord, when we give our heart to the Lord, just remember, you said, Lord, I'm giving you all. All doesn't mean, well, I'm just going to save this little, this little piece right here, this little piece of sin, this little one, just this little one. I'm just going to keep that one for me. Can't do that. That's not giving them your all. Because the Bible says a little leaven, in which I'm going to read about that a little later. A little leaven, which in the Bible most of the time it means sin. A little leaven can leaven the whole bread, can make the whole bread bad. Just a little sin. So that's why he says, I want all of you. Now, what sin you do have, after you give me your all, I'll help you with it. I'll help you get rid of it. He'll give us the strength we need to overcome whatever sin it is. And we're always going to have, once he cleanses us from this sin, then we're going to realize, well, here's another one. Okay? You were doing this one and you didn't even realize you had this one over here. So then he starts working on that one. Like people who smoke. I'm just using this as an example. People who smoke. Well, Christians, some Christians are like, how can you be a Christian? You smoke. You know what? That ain't nothing. That ain't nothing. This person might have a, a, the sin of pride. The Lord's, the Lord's saying, hey, I'm going to take care of the sins that can hurt you or others. That's the sin I'm going to take care of. Smoking, we'll take care of that sin later. You understand what I'm saying? He doesn't, he doesn't take all your sin at one time and have you stop all of them. He gives you the strength to clean this one, and then to clean this one, and to clean this one. Sin is sin, but there's some sins, like adultery, that's not just affecting you. That's affecting another person. That's affecting another soul. You see what I'm saying? Smoking, that's, that's affecting you. 
But sins that affect other people, that's the ones he wants to clean first. So don't look at someone if they're a Christian and they say, I'm born again, and they're smoking a cigarette. Well, maybe the Lord hasn't dealt with them on that yet. Don't judge them because they smoke. Because the Lord will judge them, will we'll deal with them with that. But right now, apparently, he's doing other things. He wants other sins out of that life, out of their life before he, he works on this one. Okay, that's why we shouldn't, you know, judge people by what they do. Because maybe the Lord's taking care of something else. In verse 27. So the servant of the household came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? Like I said, the householder here is Jesus. And his servants come to him and ask him, Where are all these weeds coming from? And he answered them in the next verse. He said unto them, in verse 28, He said unto them, An enemy, and we know who the enemy is, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Will thou then that we go and gather them up? So his servants are saying, Should we go gather up the weeds? If you're lost, then the devil wants to keep you that way. If you're a Christian, then the devil wants to tempt you. And have you sin, and have you fall, and live a defeated life for the Lord. He is our enemy. He is our enemy. These are things he can do. And the servants say, "Should we go gather them up, the weeds from the te- uh, the tares from the wheat?" And the Lord answered them in verse twenty nine. He said, "Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them." The Lord is saying no to the servants. You're thinking, well, why wouldn't he want to separate the two? Because servants, servants don't know the hearts, like I just said a while ago. Don't know the hearts of a person. You you can look at me and say, man, that Jesse knows the Bible. He can teach. But you don't know where my heart is. Nobody knows where my heart is except me and the Lord. You might say, oh, for sure he's a Christian. Don't pull him up. But that person over there doing this or whatever he's doing, let's pull that up. Let's pull him up. You know, so he told the servants. Right here he said, the servants were the one asking him, should we pull up the the tares, the wheat, I mean the, uh, the weeds away from the wheat? And the Lord said, no. The servants, later on in this verse, the weepers, which is the angels, they're the ones who's going to gather them up because the angels will know The Lord will show them which ones are Christians and which ones are lost. But the servants, we don't know. Verse 30. Let both grow together. Okay, let the lost people and the Christians grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say unto the weepers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. We know what he's talking about, right? He, right here he said, let both grow together. Let the Christian and lost people grow together into the harvest, which is the end of time. And he's saying, and at the end of time, I will say unto the weepers, and who's the weepers? Angels. angels. He will tell the angels, gather ye first the tares. And who's the tares? Lost people. lost people. And bind them in bundles to what? Burn them. What's hell? Hell's where we're going, where you're going to get burned if you're lost. So that's what he's saying right here. But gather the wheat. Now he's se- they're separating the two. The tares, the lost people, they're going down to be burned. But the the wheat, which is Christians, they're going to heaven, to God's born. They they he calls it born right here because he's he's talking in parables. Remember, he's talking in parables. But what he's saying here, the lost people are going to burn. But gather the wheat, the Christians, and bring them to my house, to my born. Revelations twenty, verses ten through fifteen will tell you about that. So we understand what, what he's talking about to hear. Now verse 31. Another parable put he forth unto them saying. The kingdom of heaven. Which we said that was Jesus. Is like to a grain of mustard seed. Which a man took. Which right here is talking about witness. Christians I mean. And, and sowed which means witness he preached. In the field. In the world. Okay remember all these what these things mean as I'm reading them to you. Verse 32, which indeed is the least of all seeds. He's he's saying the mustard seed is the least of all seeds. 
But when it grows, it's the greatest among the herbs and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lounge in the branches thereof. Okay, let's see what this says. The reason it says it's the least of all seeds is because when you receive the Word of God, it doesn't mean too much to you at the beginning. When baby Christians, when someone just gives their, their heart to the Lord, this really doesn't mean that much to them. They know one thing. They know what they want to, they want to live for the Lord. That's all they know. Okay, so it does, that doesn't, they're the least of all seeds. So they're, they're not really much there as a Christian because they're just born again. So they need to read this and to start understanding it. And when they do that, when you study and you grow, it makes you strong. Better than any medicine. Right here it says, it's greater, it's, it is the greatest among herbs. Herbs is a medicine, right? A lot of, me a lot of medicines are from herbs. So it's talking about medicine here. Jesus is better than any medicine. Any medicine you can take, Jesus is better than that. So we need to study the Word so it can make us strong. And you become solid and firm in your faith like a tree. And you got some pretty big trees out there. So this is what that verse is talking about. Understand the verse. We as Christians who are obedient to the Word of God have the rest and peace of the Word, right? And when trials and tribulations come, we're still full of joy, like I said a while ago. But lost people who see, but lost people who see that, that's a witness to them. How can they be rejoicing when this is happening to them? How can they be rejoicing? See, there, you're being a preacher, you're being a witness without saying anything. Your light is shining. Because they see, well, I know this just happened to them, so why are they acting like that? Amen? That's a way of witnessing without using your mouth. That's the way you be a light without using your mouth. So people around us, we're a witness to them. We're either a good witness or we're a bad witness. You, you see, did you hear me? You're either a good witness for the Lord or you're a bad witness. If you proclaim to be a Christian and when something happens to you and they're looking at you, they're just waiting to see how you're going to handle it. Believe me, they are. Because when you don't handle it right, that's their excuse to say, well, why not, should I be a Christian if that's the way I'm going to act? That person is no different from me. When I first became a Christian, working at the shipyard, I used to cuss a lot. But I wanted to quit cussing because I knew that wasn't right. And uh, I was used, had a sledgehammer and I was hitting something. I forgot what it was. But I did hit my thumb. And it did hurt. But as soon as I hit it, as soon as I hit it, now, for a while... I had already been concentrating on not the curse. I had to at first. I had to concentrate on it. Okay, don't don't say you know, at first, but then after a little while, it was just automatic. I didn't have to curse. I didn't have to uh, say a curse word when something happened. It just wasn't there no more. Well, by this time it was gone. So when I hit my thumb with that sledgehammer, and it hurt, it never even came to my mind to to say a curse word. But as soon as I hit it. I, I do remember this. Eyes, the guys that were right there around, they were like, boom. I mean, they focused on me quick. They were just waiting because they knew I was a Christian. I proclaimed to be a Christian, and I had a Christian walk. So as soon as that happened, their eyes came on me like that because they were like, cuss, please cuss, so they, could, so they could talk, you know, say things about me. Oh, yeah, you're a Christian. You know what I'm saying? But it wasn't there. Now, the birds of the air, where it says up here, so that the birds of the air, the birds of the air is speaking about lost ones, just like it says in verse 4. In verse 4, And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Back in verse 4, at the very top, we talked about that. So the birds <clears throat> of the air. Now, who is the prince and power of the air right now? Satan. Ephesians 2 2. So when it says the air, he's speaking about the prince and power of the air, which is the devil. So these birds are lost people from the air, from the prince. They're, they're under control of the prince of the air, which is the devil. And they came, and this, so that the birds of the air come and lounge in the branches thereof. These birds, now listen, these birds, like I said a while ago, when you're going through trials and tribulations and they see you going through it, 
rejoicing, they want that. And believe it or not, some lost people, those who want to be around Christians because they see that they're always happy, after a little while, they want to be around that because they want to be happy. So after a little while, they're going to they're gonna want what you have. And before you know it, they're born again. Okay? But right here, these birds... They sat, they gathered themselves on the branches of where the Christians are. Because they saw a difference in them. They saw a difference in Christians. Because guess what? God is preparing a place for me in heaven. He says it, right? God said, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. So let's think about that. Verse 33. Another parable spake he unto them. The kingdom of heaven is likened unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. Many times in the Bible, like I said, the word leaven represents evil. So when you read the word leaven in the Bible, it does represent evil, but not here. Here it says it's like heaven, so it can't be evil. It says the kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, so it can't be bad, right? In what way is the kingdom like leaven? Why? Well, the way leaven works. Leaven, you put it in bread, it's just a little piece of dough or whatever it is. It's just a little piece. But you put it in bread and it spreads. And that's how it's like heaven. That's what we do. Okay? That is like the kingdom of heaven. So that's, that's how we are. We spread, we're, we should spread the good news. Right? That's our ministry. And that's what we should be doing. And that's what it's comparing it to. Y'all, do y'all see that? It says the woman here that who was doing the cooking, it represents the person who spread in the seed and did it little by little. Because you only put a little leaven in the bread. And that's how, you know, when we witness to people, to people, you know, we plant the seed and then little by little somebody waters that seed. It might even be you watering it later, but the seed is planted, right? And what's the seed? That with the parable we talked about before, the seed is the word of God. Now, don't get confused between the two parables, okay? You might want to go back and make sure that you, because they mean they're they're different in both parables, and it tells you exactly what they mean. So you shouldn't get confused. So when you read it, just like I said, I have to read these verses down here, so you would understand these verses over here. In Romans 4, 14, 11, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. On the day of judgment, everyone will see that Jesus was for real. That was uh, verse 33. Now, 34 and 39, I've already read those. Now, in verse 40, As therefore the tares, which is who? Lost people. Lost people are gathered and burned in the fire. So shall it be in the end of this world. We already know this. In verse 41. The Son of Man shall send forth His angels, and they shall gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity. So the Son of Man, which is Jesus, has angels. And God is the only one who <coughs> has angels. Now, if right here, if God is the only one, God has angels, right? They're all in heaven. Okay, the devil and the demons, his angels. Remember, they're all, they were all angels, remember? And God had to kick them out because they, they rebelled against them, right? So God has angels. So this right here says, The Son of Man shall send forth his angels. <laughs> is, this not, is Jesus not God? I and mean, when you read this, how can people say Jesus is not God? Only God has angels. And right here it plainly says, The Son of Man shall send forth His angels. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it makes me laugh. It really does. I mean, what are, what are they reading? Yeah. How can they say Jesus is not God? God is the only one with angels. There's not a set of angels over here for God and then another set of angels over here for Jesus. That's nowhere in the Bible. Right. So right here it is plainly shown... The Son of Man, Jesus, has angels. So if He has angels, then He must be God. Okay? Amen? Out of His kingdom. 
Speaking of the millennium, when you let Satan loose for a little while, in the millennium, it starts off all Christians. And it's 4,000 years. But it's not heaven. Now, Christians are going to have babies. Those babies are, are the ones that are going to grow up. Heaven still make the choice like we did. So there will be some who will rebel against the Lord in the millennium. Now, I explained, I explained this on the, on the teaching of the last days. But there will be lost people in the millennium, but not the ones who came from the tribulation, you know, and not us, because we're going to be in the millennium. Christians who went through the tribulation are going to be there. But it's for a thousand years. Now, in those thousand years when they have babies, those babies are not born Christians, just like now. Until the Lord, until we go to be in heaven, this is the millennium. We're not talking about heaven here. Don't get confused. We're not talking about heaven. We're talking about the millennium. The lion lays with the lamb and all that. Okay? But it's not heaven. So these Christians will have babies and they'll grow up and they'll make a choice also. Do, I, do they want to live for the Lord or do they want to live for the devil? Because he's going to let the devil loose for a little while. Why? Because if they were just plain 100% Christian, born again, why is he letting the devil loose? Because just like us, we have the power of God in us. We're not going back to the way we were because if we did, then we weren't really born again, Right? That's why he lets Satan loose for a little while to see those who were born in the millennium to see which way they want to go. And the new earth is his kingdom. I talked to you all about that. The new earth is going to be God's kingdom. Second Peter chapter 3 verses 10 through 13 <clears throat> talks about that. It will be clean from any evil and sin. The new earth. Verse 42. And shall cast them into the furnace of fire there shall be welling and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now who's going to have the ears to hear? Who's going to have the ears to understand these parables? Christians. Christians. The Christians who are light of the world. We are the light of the world, right? Matthew 5.14 We are the light of the world. It says a city, a Christian that cannot be hid. So if our light is shining, the Lord says it in Matthew 15, 14, if our light is shining, if we're walking with the Lord, if our eyes are on the Lord, not on whatever happened, what's happening around you, we are going to shine. We're going to be that light. All right? Isaiah 43, 7, it says, Even everyone that is called by my name, for I have created him for my glory, for his glory. We are going to glow. When we give our life to him, we are going to glow. He made us for His glory. That's what it means. Now I know, I'm not saying we're going to be perfect. There's going to be times that we stumble. But a Christian, a Christian will get back on his feet. A Christian will get back on his feet. If you stay down and you don't get back on your feet, you weren't there. You hear me? You weren't there. Just like it talks about backsliding. The prodigal son, he, wanted, he needed to go into the world. He went into the world, and he didn't like it at all. And what happened? He came back. God made you for His glory. We have ears to hear, because we're in here. Everyone in here is born again, so we do have ears to hear, and we need to understand what He's saying. 